Good afternoon. Uh, as Noel said, my name is Lance Richman. I'm uh, the PAC Waste Plus Technical Officer focused on hazardous waste. Um, and I very much appreciate uh, folks attending this deep dive session on the healthcare medical waste investment plan. Uh, I won't take much more of your time, but I do want to just shortly discuss kind of what our goals and objectives are for this deep dive presentation. Obviously, we're all interested in reducing adverse uh, health and environmental impacts from healthcare waste um, and disposal of healthcare waste, particularly in the, the, the new world of COVID-19 is, is, a, is, a, is a pretty hot topic these days. But I do have a couple of objectives um, uh, for this deep dive, and I, I hope that, uh, that folks will join me in, in achieving them. The first thing that I'd, I'd like to do, and one of the reasons we have a couple of our presenters here, is um, to inform the participants uh, in this deep dive about the purposes and form of the incinerator effort, um, of incineration, I'm sorry, and the uh, investment plan that we're working on. Uh, I know there is some, um, some misunderstandings about what incineration is. Um, and how uh, it's used in the healthcare waste disposal field. Um, so we're gonna have a presentation specifically on that. And then a uh, second objective is to talk about um, the endorsement of this healthcare medical waste investment plan um, and uh, support a path forward for donor interventions. It's important to know that uh, there has been significant investments over the past decade or so in this technology, in utilizing incinerators in the Pacific region to dispose of healthcare waste. Um, we've had some successes, but uh, certainly the sustainability of this investment is really in question right now. Um, a lot of the facilities um, uh, are in need of maintenance and repair, and we're, um, we're looking at utilizing this particular investment plan to, to hopefully address that. So, before we go on, um, I would like to go ahead and, and start going through the presentations. Uh, first up um, is Michael uh, Kokia. Uh, and Michael, um, if you could introduce yourself, he's going to, to um, uh, discuss uh, the incinerator technology um, itself. So Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Uh, my name is Michael Koch. I'm from an Australian company called Advanced Combustion Engineering. Basically, I'm going to be talking about incinerators, um, how they work, and probably in the Pacific environment, probably more appropriately, why a lot of them aren't working. Uh, if we can go to the slideshow, if we can go to the next slide, please, slide two. Advanced Combustion Engineering, as I said, we're a small Australian company. The company's been active since the 60s, well before my time. I've personally been in the game about 30 years. Uh, we pretty much have 100% of the Australian market. We've done quite a bit in Malaysia, quite a bit in Indonesia, done, uh, done a job in the UK. And lately, we've done a, no, a little bit in the Pacific. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, oh, sorry, back to uh, the company. Uh, in terms of the Pacific, now, my first job in the Pacific was food, uh, Fiji and Suva, probably 20 years ago. I did five small units for pack waste about five years ago. Um, two for the Southern Islands Ports Authority, and recently we've just recently supplied two units to Tonga and one to Tuvalu, uh, all for medical waste apart from the Port Authority and Sinrays, which are for more of a general waste. Now back to the slides. Uh, the description of incineration. Incineration is purely um, is the combustion of waste materials at high temperature to produce an inert ash, carbon dioxide, water, and trace level of pollutants. Basically, we take the waste material or fuel, either the waste or a diesel material, um, ignite it, and that will produce heat, will produce combustion gases, and an inert ash. We can go to the next slide, please. Now, this is a sort of scale of plant we would typically build. Now, this is a, a plant we did quite a few years ago at Melbourne, Australia, ton and a half an hour, continuous. Um, Quite a large plant, totally unapplicable for the Pacific environment. We can go to the uh, next slide, please. This is another plant, uh, basically, uh, again, this is a large continuous plant, about 500 kilogram, 500 kilogram per hour, operates around the clock. 
If you look at this plant, basically what we have is on the left-hand side of the screen, we have the incinerator. Now that is where we burn the waste, where we take the waste materials and produce an ash and we burn the smoke. On the right-hand side of the screen is the air pollution control plant. So basically we are taking the combustion gases from the incineration process, run them through the air pollution control plant. And this is a sort of plant you would need to achieve EC emission standards. And this sort of plant is totally you know, unfeasible in the Pacific environment. It's too large, too expensive. Basically what we're looking at here is about two and a half million US for the incinerator, about the same for the APC plant. So all up about $5 million of which half is air pollution control. And this would achieve the EC emission standards. Okay, our next, thank you. Our next slide, this is uh, one of our spread pack waste incinerators. Basically very different to the larger plants we put in Melbourne, but what this plant basically consists of is a primary chamber. Sorry, can you see my mouse? No, you can't. Uh, what we have, the lower chamber is, I consider this a high quality incinerator suitable for the Pacific environment. Um, the bottom chamber is the primary chamber where we take the waste materials and produce an ash. The top chamber, um, the round cylinder, is the secondary combustion chamber. The function of that chamber is to burn the smoke. So this plant, when operating properly, should operate in a totally smoke-free manner. Um, and um, no, and most times it would. Sorry, if we can go back, go back to the previous slide, stick to that. Now this sort of plant is probably about 150 US thousand dollars. Uh, if we were to try and achieve EC standards on this plant, we would need an air pollution control plant, which would probably be another, another maybe two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars. So we would be looking at about a half million dollars investment to build a very small plant that could achieve EC standards. And really, it'd be a very technical plant, it'd be a complex plant, and I don't think this would be suitable in the Pacific environment. Now, if someone tells you they can put a wet scrubber on this uh, for thirty thousand, fifty, or even hundred thousand dollars and achieve EC standards. Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. They're lying. You'll see all sorts of all sorts of claims on small plants being capable of achieving EC standards. They cannot. Uh, the best we can hope in the Pacific environment is a plant like this, where we have uh, we burn the waste and we have a very good secondary combustion chamber, so we have smoke-free operation. As mentioned before, this plant, when running properly, should run in a smoke-free manner. If you look at it, you wouldn't be able to know it's running because you'd see a heat haze coming out of the chimney and nothing else. We go to slide seven, please. Okay, the, the main components of the incinerator are the primary combustion chamber, as I said, that's the chamber where we burn the waste. The waste goes in um, and we produce an ash. That's the role of the primary chamber, produce an ash, inert ash, which can then go to the landfill. Secondary chamber takes a, takes a smoke from the primary chamber and basically burns anything combustible to carbon dioxide and water. So a smoke free haze. We'll still have some pollutants, we'll still have some dust, some heavy metals, and we can't get rid of those unless we go to um, the air pollution control plant, which I said would triple, quadruple the cost of this sort of plant and extremely complex for this environment. Uh, we have the discharge stack. Um, we have the combustion air control system, and that's critical on a plant like this. An incinerator is a combustion device. We take the waste, we add air. We need to control how we add air to the incinerator. And this is probably one of the critical differences between a cheaper incinerator and a more complex, more advanced incinerator is the way we control the air. Um, on the primary chamber, if we add too much air, we burn too quickly, the incinerator will smoke. If we don't add enough air, it's not gonna burn the ash out, we're gonna have poor ash quality. So combustion air control is critical. In the secondary chamber, we don't have enough air, uh, it's gonna smoke. We have too much air, we have, we're cooling the chamber down too much, we need a lot of auxiliary fuel to maintain our combustion temperatures. Um, burners and fuel supply system, uh, no, that's important. No, we need to make sure that we have a regular reliable fuel supply system. We'll, I'll go into that a bit more detail later on. And we need a control system which controls our burners, our combustion air system, controls the plant. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, this shows our three of the packed waste incinerators. Uh, they're our, what I call our CA15 and a one and a half cubic metre volume primary chamber. And we've installed, where have we installed these? One at Latoka Hospital. Um, one at Port Vila and one in Ukalufa Tonga. There's also one in Gizo, which is installed, but for unforeseen reasons, never commissioned. 
Um, and you'll notice on this incinerator, we have a larger door, which is where we load the waste in. We close the door. These are a batch incinerator. We basically put the waste in, uh, start the process, and the incinerator will run for a number of hours. And that timing is sufficient so that that waste is then reduced to an inert ash. Uh, we come back either next morning or after a number of hours, and we rake the ash out through the lower door. Uh, no, small, solid, no, well-built device. And next slide, slide, please. And this is a secondary combustion chamber. This is the device that sits on top of the primary chamber and its sole function is to burn the smoke coming from the primary chamber. Um, if this unit is undersized, has a poor air control system, burner fails, it's going to smoke. And that can range from you know, bad cases of very black smoke. And that's what you'll find for local incinerator. You'll get lots of black smoke to at times a very light smoke. If there's a slight issue, say, you no, know, um, no, the unit has been slightly overloaded. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the excess of an incineration project or an incinerator project, basically, there's a number of factors which are all very important. One is design. You know, you've got to have the right design to start with. If you haven't got a decent design, you know, you basically have got no hope. Quality and construction, you need a plant that's going to survive the Pacific environment. Pacific is quite a hostile environment. It's very corrosive. It's hot. Um, if you haven't built the plant properly, it's just not going to survive. Uh, typically, these plants will last 20, 30 years. We've had plants um, and Antarctic bases for 30 years operational plus. Uh, in the Pacific environment, it's not maintained or not built right for quality of construction. It's not going to last five years. Um, no, basically, a lot of them aren't going to last two years. No. Um, no, the plant needs to be installed and commissioned by a professional that knows what they're doing. No, it's good. And during that process, uh, the local operators need to be trained how to maintain that plant. Uh, they need to be trained how to run the plant and they need to be given a proper manual, which has all the information they could possibly need to maintain that plant. Uh, in addition to that manual and initial training, they need backup. They need to basically, basically get on the computer, get on the phone, call the supplier and have backup when and as required. No. And that is, as, no, that is how we work. We always work like that. And, no. You know, there's quite often you'll, you'll hear many incinerators that basically are uh, once the units have been put in, they never hear back from the manufacturer. No contact. First thing that breaks down, the incinerator sits there and is never used again. Okay. And probably um, another very important factor is you need ownership by the end user. You need someone on site, someone that takes responsibility for the unit, someone that knows probably the first to port a call to the manufacturer. Something goes wrong, that guy gets on the phone, sends an email, you no, know, and can have a proper discussion with the manufacturer on you know, how to resolve that problem. Most problems can be resolved over the phone, you know, if need be. You know, uh, if the user hasn't got parts, um, they can be sent parts. Um, and if the worst case is, uh, no, manufacturer gets on a plane, goes over there, does a service visit. No. But typically, on uh, any of our incinerators, we would sell them and ship them with an adequate supply of spare parts. You've got to basically, um, quite often, this incinerator is the only disposal site at a hospital. If it goes down, the hospital has lost its method of treatment of clinical waste. So we really, uh, any component that can shut the plant down within co a reasonable cost should be available as a spare on site. We can carry on. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, here's a couple of failed incinerators. This one is uh, basically a, a, a Mediburn, small unit, uh, sitting at the hospital, obviously it sort of failed for some reason and it sat there and uh, this particular unit's located quite near the coast and yeah, it's not in good shape. And <laughs> yeah, that, that's just one example. Next next slide, please. Another unit uh, donated by the Japanese in particular case, this one's at Port Vila. Um, no, I don't believe they'll provide instruction. Something went wrong, no, no excess to spare parts. All it takes is one minor item, which might cost 30 US dollars to fail, and the incinerator is rendered obsolete. It sits there, never used, no ownership. It just sits there and you know, waits till someone else comes along and builds them a new incinerator. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's one at Gizo in uh, the Solomons. Uh, again, a, a donated Japanese incinerator sitting there. I understand it has been used, but um, no, basically unused for a long period of time. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a small uh, 
UK built incinerate unit. This one's actually in Tonga. Uh, basically, uh, no backup the manufacturer. Um, most minor of, of issues, you no, know, could be, you no, know, as I said, a $30 component of burner has failed. The incinerator sits there. This particular unit is pretty poor quality construction. See how it's in an enclosure, but it's very poorly corroded. Um, I believe this is one of the units we're currently replacing. The next slide, please. Okay, back to the design. Um, we'll go in more detail on the actual design of the unit. We've got the primary chamber, a secondary combustion chamber, and the burner and fuel delivery system. The primary chamber, the two main parameters are the combustion volume. Uh, basically, the size of the chamber determines how much waste it can burn. If we put too much waste into a chamber, it's going to get too hot and damage the unit. Uh, so, no, we basically size the chamber based on the, the quantity of waste we expect. Um, we have a range of controlled air units going from CA07 to all the way up to a CA65, and we've got, yeah, both, all those sizes in the Pacific. And what's also critical is the combustion air entry and control. As I mentioned, it's an incinerator. We need air to burn the waste. We don't have sufficient air. We're either not going to burn the waste or we have too much air. We're going to burn too quickly and overload the secondary chamber. Now, also back to the secondary chamber, uh, what is critical there is combustion volume. And if we're a secondary chamber, we refer, well, we have what we call is a combustion chamber retention time. Typically, we take the gases from the primary chamber, excuse me for a moment. We take the gases from the primary chamber and we maintain a matter specified combustion temperature for a specified retention time. So we hold those gases at a high temperature for so many seconds of time in the presence of sufficient air and that will burn anything combustible. Uh, typically uh, on this sort of plant, you know, we were building these sort of scale plants in Australia maybe 20, 30 years ago, and we would have a third of a second retention time in the secondary chamber. We can go to the next slide, please. You look at that, uh, you'll see the um, two incinerators. We'll go to the one on the right hand side first. Um, you've got the primary chamber at the bottom and the secondary chamber at the top. So that this particular unit is sized to hold the gases from the primary chamber at 1000 degrees Celsius for one second retention time. And manufacturers have all got their methods of calculating retention time. And uh, frankly, a lot of them are quite dodgy. Uh, the unit on the left is a small incinerate unit. You'll notice the primary chambers are pretty much the same. Both these units can do about 50 kilogram per hour of clinical waste. But you'll notice on the left-hand side, the secondary chamber is a piddly little box compared to what's on the right-hand side. Um, and they're pretty much claiming the same thing. And they're claiming the same retention time. So you can imagine, whilst these incinerators will both burn the same quantity of waste, the one on the left is gonna basically smoke most of the time, whereas the one on the right should only smoke if there's an issue. And you'll notice too, um, the combustion air systems. So uh, we'll go into those in more detail. But that just gives you a you know, simple indication. This is a pretty much a CA07. Um, that's our 0.7 cubic meter primary chamber. Next slide, please. Our, okay, now we'll go to the primary chamber combustion air, which as I mentioned before, combustion air is critical to these plants. You've got to have good control of combustion air, both in the primary and secondary. On the left-hand side, you'll notice that blue, blue item under the control panel is a fan. That is a primary chamber combustion air fan. That provides primary combustion air through a series of air holes. And that air passes through the waste to burn the ash down, burn the waste to an ash. Um, that fan is equipped with variable speed drive. So at, at the start of the process, when we first start burning, that fan is off because we don't need air. We've already got air in through the system from the, when we loaded the waste. 20 minutes into the process, that fan comes on and that fan will modulate high speed, low speed based on the temperature in that primary chamber control on our combustion rate. We don't want to go too fast. We're going to overload the secondary chamber and smoke. We don't want to go too low. We're going to have poor quality ash control. Okay, that's our Port Vila CA15 on the left. Now the unit on the right, um, a much simpler unit, much cheaper unit, but much simpler. Um, not in proportional, cost is not in proportional to what you're getting. Um, the unit on the right has a primary fan on burner on the bottom and a secondary burner on the top. There are no separate combustion air fans. And this particular unit relies on the combustion air going through the burner. And that provides the air, not only to burn the oil in front of the burner, but to burn the waste materials. So that's a fixed damper. So at some point during commission, someone decides the position of that damper and that damper basically has to 
be suitable for all operating conditions. At times there's going to be too much air, at times there's not going to be enough air. It's a simple, cheap system, uh, highly effective, pretty much ineffective. But that's that's you know, what has been provided. Next slide, please. Um, secondary chamber, same, same, same deal here. We have a secondary, uh, on the right-hand side of the photo, you'll see those blue items, they're a combustion air fan. That's a secondary combustion air fan. We introduce combustion air through a series of holes and that air is then mixed with the gases coming from below from the primary chamber. So we're taking the smoke from below and we're mixing it with combustion air. So that introduces the air to anything organic, anything combustible in that secondary chamber and we provide sufficient time for that combustible gas to burn out. Um, if you look at the cheaper unit on the left-hand side, same thing, you've got, a, you've, you've got a box, you've got a basic box, a small burner, and the only combustion air going into that unit is again through the burner itself. Uh, a manual, manual slide sort of valve control on the burner. Uh, and so that has to basically comply, it has to meet all the requirements. Now, typically on a secondary chamber, when you start up the unit, you're heating the unit up, you're burning diesel. So you don't want much air in there. You need to heat that chamber up quickly and for economical purposes, you want to minimise uh, minimize, um, the diesel going in. So normally we would turn that air right down at startup, get the unit up to temperature. When we start burning, that fan would ramp up, provide enough air. And based on the temperatures in that chamber, that fan would ramp, speed up, slow down to provide the air we need to ensure we have pretty much no smoke. Well, there should be no smoke. If we find it does smoke at times, that we can then adjust it so that the unit does not smoke. Um, the unit on the left, there's absolutely no control. Um, you set up, someone sets it up in the early days, and that has to comply, has to basically, you've got to heat up with that unit, but bear in mind, there's a much smaller chamber to heat up, so it's probably not that bad. Um, and you've got to ensure there's enough air to burn all the smoke coming from the chamber, uh, from the primary chamber. Next slide, please. Yeah, hey, Michael, we've, we've only got about two or three more minutes, so if you could no worries, wrap up. Thank, thank you, Lance. No, great for that, because I forgot to set my timer. Uh, okay, burner fuel supply system. The reason I mention this is we've had an issue in the Pacific with a number of incinerators where basically uh, the units have been put in after a short space of time, one of the burners, typically the secondary burner, which is higher up the incinerator, fails, stops working, and the incinerator, incinerator basically sits there, does not work, and in some cases have never worked again. Uh, what we've had is, you'll notice on the top right, you'll see a picture of a stationary tank. Uh, that's a typical cheap supply, tank sits on the ground, one, one line which then feeds the two burners. Uh, what, what is needed and what we're doing, we're repairing a number of these specific incinerators is, we're basically changing the system, we're elevating the tank so we've got gravity feed, separate lines, so each burner has its own supply line, so we're not choking the top burner, the upper burner or fuel, because uh, these simple packaged burners, if you run them dry without oil for a couple of minutes, you'll kill the pump, you'll kill the burner, the plant does not run. Um, so that is an important factor. No, this is part of design. When you design a plant, if you want it to work, you put in an elevated tank, you put in a two supply system. Um, the single, single supply line, ground level tank is a cheaper approach, but it has resulted in big issues in the Pacific. Next slide, please. Control system. Um, what you'll see is on the left is a typical control system, control panel, uh, a screen which indicates what's going on, um, a PLC which controls the process, fully automated, press a button and start the cycle, the plant runs through its cycle. Uh, in the one on the left, there's a couple of grey boxes on the right hand side, you know, they're variable speed drives, they control the fan speed. Uh, on the right hand side, you've got um, you know, the smaller incinerator, their control panel, very, very basic, very crude, um, totally different, very different. Next slide, please. Okay, quality construction. Uh, this is a big thing. Um, no, on a cheaper incinerator, um, they're basically uh, making very, very large sacrifices on the quality. And um, a poor quality unit just will not survive, does not survive in the Pacific environment. Um, Incineration is a pretty tough game. You've got to build it right. And if you're compromising in your areas, you're not, it's not like you're going to get five years or 10 years. You're not even going to get two years out of a poor quality incinerator. Okay, uh, in terms of steel, 
it's got to be heavy duty. You know, it's, it's got to be thick steel. You can't make it out of three millimeter plate. You've got to look, you need a thick steel, five millimeter plate, you know, 10 on the flanges, 12 on the flanges. And you've got to take that steel and you've got to treat it right. You've got to basically uh, sandblast it, remove any corrosion on it, coat it in, in a zinc coating, which is a sacrificial uh, anode, which protects the paint. And then you've got to put high, high temperature paint on it. And that sort of system will survive in the Pacific. Um, uh, on Honiara, where that very corroded incinerator was, we provided them with a incinerator of this system, very thick steel, inorganic paint, high temperature paint. And we also gave them a 20 litre drum of top paint and said every year, go along, give it a coat of paint. If you do that, you know, this sort of plant will last 15, 20 years right on the coast. No. And Michael, we've got, to, yep. we've got to get moving here. So uh, if you could okay. just wrap up and, and we could, okay. you know, there probably will be some questions related to, to your no, experience. Worry. Okay, refractory, refractory is also important. Um, brick is far better. Next slide, please. Not many to go. Uh, you'll notice thickness of steel. Your top unit is a bare steel. Bottom unit on the left is a unit painted with an organic zinc for corrosion resistance. Right hand side is top coat, high temperature paint. You'll see the brick work. Brick is better than cast. Next slide, please. Plant startup. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's got to be commissioned properly. You've got to dry out the refractory. And you've got to train the staff for both an operation and maintenance. You've got to provide spare parts and got to have access to a service visit from the manufacturer if and when required. Next slide, please. These are typical spare parts. Spare burner, spare parts. These should be supplied for every incinerator. I think that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Actually, that was that was very in depth. I do appreciate it. Uh, I think that was, uh, that was great. <laughs> a lot of times when we think about incinerators, we don't really spend the time to understand the technology well enough. Um, so I do appreciate that. But I do want to uh, to now quickly go to our uh, to our World Bank uh, folks, uh, Rosie Davy and Natasha Vetma. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, you're, uh, you're on. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. So I will get us started. Um, I'm going to talk through our Pacific and PNG portfolio experience with incinerators um, and a little bit on healthcare waste management. And then I'll hand over to Natasha for some good work that she's been doing with the government in Samoa. So next slide, please. So we have health investments in quite a few countries across the Pacific. This has increased significantly because of our COVID response. Um, but we also have a few health system strengthening projects that are already underway in P Papua New Guinea. Um, and we're preparing projects in Tuvalu and Kiribati as well at the moment. Um, through these projects, we're seeing some challenges and deficiencies in healthcare waste management in the region. Um, and we're doing what we can to integrate improved healthcare waste management and infection prevention and control practices into um, project design. And this includes some investments in incinerators in Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Samoa, and the Solomon Islands. So next slide, please. So we have some lessons learned. So we're seeing that the healthcare waste management deficiencies go quite far beyond the available availability of the incinerators. So we're often seeing poor waste management practice in health facilities. So waste isn't been correctly segregated, it's been poorly handled, transported, stored and so on. Um, and there's not enough focus on strengthening or preparing and implementing healthcare waste management systems, plans, policies, procedures, um, capacity can be low and healthcare professionals don't have the budget to implement this. So because of this, I, I expect, we're seeing that many of the incinerators are not operational. So Michael illustrated this very well with some of his photos. Um, the Pacific is a little bit of an incinerator graveyard. So poor maintenance practices, um, poor waste segregation in the first place, I expect, are leading to inoperable, inefficient, and polluting incinerators. So this is essentially a high level of operational risk. So again, as Michael mentioned, there's a lot of old technology out there. Um, we're seeing examples of where it might be poorly placed. So it's operating poorly, it's polluting, and it's placed near to a sensitive receptor. So these are all things that we need to try and address going forward. 
So how can we learn from these past mistakes? Um, first up, I'd like to propose we look at getting the appropriate technology. Um, alongside that, to either develop and implement or strengthen existing management systems and plans, including a large capacity component. Um, a big part of that is working with the governments to ensure that there's sufficient budget and resource planning. So for example, the World Bank, we come along, we finance the installation of the incinerator. We make sure that they have spare parts that go along with it um, and that there's sufficient training that goes with it as well. Um, but it, it's not going to last long if there isn't budget and maintenance scheduled. So there needs to be maintenance, there needs to be monitoring, and there needs to be some sort of mechanism to get repairs and assistance as needed, um, which leads quite nicely into what Lance is promoting. Um, on top of that, this is kind of my pet, pet promotion, pet issue. Assurance is really important. So you can have all of these systems and plans in place, um, but they're not, they're not necessarily all that much use unless you go in and verify that they're working. So one, you need to verify that your mitigation measures are in place, and two, that you need to verify that they're effective. So it's that whole management system thing of plan, do, act, um, check, act. Um, so, you know, you, you feed back in and you can adjust your systems as needed. Um, so that's all from me. Please, may we go to the next slide and I'll hand over to Natasha for the Samoa case study. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Natasha Vetma and I'm the environmental specialist who is actually supporting uh, two healthcare uh, projects in, in, uh, that are being implemented in Samoa. And both of these projects have actually identified issues with the healthcare waste management. So one of them is uh, Samoa Health, Health System Strengthening Program, and the other one was prepared now due to the COVID emergency response. So none of these projects have, uh, you know, uh, are about healthcare waste management, but they do focus uh, uh, in a way in trying to make a waste management integral part. We are also now currently preparing an additional financing project for, again, health system, which is going to have even heavier focus on the waste management. So uh, as you can see, uh, and this is quite important that, you know, you can try and put so many efforts in, 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 in some, something, but if, if there is no commitment from the government, uh, there are no champions to carry the project, the projects will actually not be implemented. So, Samoa is a very good example because uh, you know, the government has already prepared healthcare waste management strategic plan and also a Samoa healthcare waste uh, strategy, which will be from 2020 to 2025. And it all sounds very good on the paper. However, due to the COVID situation and you know, focus on different issues and as well capacity constraints, things got a bit stalled. So, here, I think that, that our team actually comes in and we are trying now to help with the action plan and to help the, the uh, bridge the delays in implementation. So if I can ask for the next slide, please. So these two projects are actually supporting several things, you know, uh, focusing also on the uh, technical, the investment. So we are trying now to finance the incinerator uh, for Savai. And I have to say that team in a consultant with international uh, waste management consultant actually opted for not to have the offshore incinerator. And this decision was driven by lessons learned from other Pacific islands, but also from Samoa. And they are trying now to tailor the technical specification to the actually maintenance capacity, the waste composition, et cetera. Because you know, whenever you receive these technical specifications from incinerators, you know. They are focused on kind of, let's call it perfect waste composition. And, you know, in, in any country, not only Pacific country, the waste composition and, in the, uh, and the waste ending up in the incinerator is not perfect, is not as specified. So this is very often leading to underperformance. We are also dealing in Pacific with what Michael also, also said, you know, harsh climates. So, you know, it, uh, it, the, the off the shell incinerator cannot really fit very well in, into this. Uh, climate. Also, we do have to understand that the capacity of uh, stakeholders in the waste management plant is not always ideal. So we have to have lots of hands-on training, etc. So 
This incinerator, now the specification has been developed in, in consultation with international specialists, but it's also focused on this UNEP guidance on the best available technology. Um, so as I mentioned, it's focusing on geographical, uh, the, the technical specification is also focusing on geographical limitations because in this kind of incinerators, you can definitely not ask for, you know, uh, proper monitoring like uh, air mortgage or, or of dioxide and so You know, the technical specification really has to be realistic and fit the ge geography, fit the capacity of the client, especially. So uh, can I ask, I'm sorry for the, no, it's, it's okay, Let, let's stay here. Uh, so we also realized that, you know, incinerator is not a standalone investment. It is a standalone investment, but it cannot function without the system. So uh, the project is actually focusing on supporting the system because by supporting the system, you will have a better uh, trained staff that will know which waste actually has to be separated and go into the incinerator. You will have better training and better operation and maintenance. So uh, we have now hired, actually government of Samoa has now hired an international waste management specialist or on a three-year basis that is going to help uh, Ministry of Health and various stakeholder to actually get the system operational. So the, this specialist is going to support Ministry of Health by establishing a system for collection, reporting, and reporting uh, uh, on waste management and audits. Also, very importantly, to establish an operational and, uh, and management plan for the incinerator to know know how to repair it, how to maintain it uh, and operate it. It is also going to uh, establish a healthcare waste management plan for the hospital clinics and allied health facilities. Also establish a training system along the full chain of healthcare, facility chain of healthcare waste. Uh, and one of the good ideas is they're going to try to move some kind of accreditation system, meaning that this Training system will be on half annual, annual basis, keeping everybody in the system trained. Uh, it's also going to develop an annual healthcare waste management reporting so that actually the whole system can react on the current conditions. So we also believe that only with this kind of a system and uh, constant training, uh, systematic training, the incinerator can only operate properly. So these are the few lessons from the, from the Samoa. Uh, we still don't have the full results yet because it's only starting, but there is definitely hope that this is going to go uh, forward with the, with the full commitment of the government. With Can I just add the last slide, please? So, I mean, these pictures actually fit very much to those that Michael presented. This is a use, you can see Apollo incinerator uh, and Savai incinerator. You know, right now in Savai, waste is only just being put in the incinerator. The doors are closed, although they have the, the, the hole in it and just, you know, uh, covered with, with the fuel and burn. So, you know, these are the realities. And I'm really happy that um, uh, Samoa government has decided to try to kind of tailor the system and also the technical specifications of the incinerator to the climate uh, uh, conditions and the capacity and, and the capacity of the country. So hopefully this will be, uh, hopefully we'll hear from, you'll hear from us in a year time or something and uh, we'll have more better results to show. So thank you very much. This is uh, again, part of uh, our discussion and I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to discuss uh, our healthcare medical waste uh, investment plan, something that we've uh, been working here uh, at SPREP um, and uh, that has been endorsed by our uh, member countries. So uh, next slide, please. You know, we in a previous program under PAC Waste um, uh, uh, invested in a number of incinerators placed in the Pacific. This actually is a photograph of one. I believe this is uh, in Nauru, if I'm not mistaken. Um, um, in any event, um, we like and have been asked by our member countries to assist uh, and treat um, uh, healthcare waste. I'm sorry, this is new way. Um, to treat uh, healthcare waste efficiently and sustainably. 
Uh, and uh, the investment, we did a pretty significant investment in incinerators um, and we commissioned, I believe around 26 separate incinerators. Um, and what we're finding, I think, is what um, the folks, our, our friends at the World Bank were discussing. Uh, many of these incinerators are in, in desperate need of maintenance as well as repair. So in the recent uh, SPREP meeting of officials, this was just a couple of weeks ago now, um, we requested uh, an endorsement by the members of this healthcare medical waste investment plan. We see it as a way to create at least in the interim over the next uh, maybe three to five uh, years, uh, sustainable healthcare waste disposal options for these hospitals. Okay, apologize for it's a bit of a busy slide, but this is what we've, uh, we've done. We've proposed to the membership of SPREP to our, our country members and which they have endorsed. And this is to create a, a facility to undertake the necessary maintenance and repairs of these incinerators currently commissioned there in the, here in the Pacific Island countries. We want them to operate at their required efficiency and to be sustainable um, and meet their outcomes. And I know uh, early on, Michael was talking about how many of these um, are not working efficiently. Uh, and so we want to bring those back, uh, uh, back to that efficiency. So what does this, what does this investment uh, plan include? Well, obviously we're gonna have to repair those incinerators that are not working. So that will require some fabrication work, that will require some procurement of parts um, and to get those incinerators back up and working again. It's difficult to do that uh, in a world of COVID, um, because it's hard to get Michael and others out into the field to do this work. Um, and so we've been evaluating our options in terms of using local uh, techniques and, and expertise as well. Um, also, uh, we're looking at engagement of the hospitals. We think that um, it's critical, but we don't think we know it's critical that, um, that the hospitals who are running these incinerators have an investment in them. And I think you've heard from our friends at the World Bank about what they're doing here in Samoa um, to, to make certain that hospital waste uh, administration and staff understand how these incinerators work and, and make certain that they uh, work properly. So that requires an engagement and a commitment by these organizations, by these hospitals. Uh, in addition, of course, we have to ensure that, that those incinerators are working at optimum efficiency. So again, we need the technical experts, the backup equipment, spare parts, et cetera, and we need to execute that routine maintenance um, uh, and make certain that the operational needs of those incinerators are met. So what we're looking at um, is incorporating and creating a facility, creating a, 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 an environment where we have a consultancy that can come and make certain that this work gets done. So we've um, put together uh, a, a proposed plan uh, to do this work. Now, we've had some commitments already from people to execute the plan. Um, and uh, obviously we've had uh, some support from Jeff Islands has indicated they would provide some funding to do this, to jumpstart the program. The PAC Waste program, while not uh, directly investing into this uh, project, are spending, we are spending on our own dime, the European Union's funding to repair a number of incinerators uh, as well. So this is the kind of work I think that's going to have to be done to keep these incinerators working sustainably uh, over the next few years um, before we come up with a, with a better disposal option. So um, because of the endorsement of this investment plan by our member countries, um, because of their request to us here in SPREP um, to, to execute this, uh, or to at least get donors to, to look for the commitment and support from donors to uh, deliver this project, um, we are, uh, doing that work now. And so what we're looking to do here and what we were looking to do with the endorsement during the SPREP meeting is to provide visibility to this plan and to, uh, to talk to donors uh, on our members' behalf 
on funding this project. So that's where we are. Um, and, um, you know, we're looking and we'll be uh, providing at the end of this, um, uh, at the end of uh, this round table, uh, a closing statement that will include discussions on this and looking for that kind of support. Um, so, so that's it. Um, that is the presentations. I know uh, there's probably some questions out there that folks have, uh, maybe perhaps about this investment plan, perhaps about what the World Bank is doing, or, or perhaps some technological questions that you might have for Michael Kokia. So um, the floor is open. Um, please, if there are any questions, uh, please provide them now. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, I, I do have uh, a quick question uh, for you, Michael, and I, I, you touched on it a little, but I'm, I'm just curious about what the uh, the capacity of these smaller and call it smaller incinerators that you've been um, uh, that you built uh, out here in the Pacific. What what kind of volumes of material can you take? How much? My apologies. We can design and build a plant to any capacity, but. Uh... Because the controls are pretty much identical, regardless of the size of the plant, it gets very expensive to build a very small plant. Uh, we've recently built uh, three C807s, which are basically what uh, Sprepin's pathways classified as their medium size incinerator. Uh, it's a 0.7 of a cubic meter, 7.7 of a cubic meter volume primary chamber. Um, no, that's um, equivalent to the incinerate unit that has the square box on top of the primary chamber. Uh, that's probably about, about 30 to 40 kilogram per hour of clinical waste, but bear in mind, these are a batch unit, so they would run for maybe a two hour batch. So we're looking at 80 kilograms per burn cycle, and we can do two burn cycles per day. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, Rosie, you have a question? Yep, thanks, Lance, um, just to help get things flowing. So a two part question for Michael. Um, the first one is, what, what are some of the most important things that you, you would cover in capacity building? Um, so, you know, who would you train? What would you train them in? Um, and then from a systems point of view, what, what are the key, key system aspects that influence the incinerator's performance? So, you know, the key things that need to be sorted out. Okay, in terms of capacity building, really, uh... As a manufacturer and provider, we would go there to commission the unit and we will train whoever the hospital presents to us to be trained. And typically we would have the operational staff who really need to know how to run the machine. But we do need one good technical person, only one uh, that can you know, understand the machine well enough that they identify all the components and can identify what's wrong. So they can then communicate to us if there's an issue, then we can resolve it together. Now, what unfortunately happens is uh, communication is very, very hard in the Pacific. Um, no, Solomon's, uh, no. The chat was one of the presenters. Uh, I, I assume he's, no, the communication system isn't working. We can't get hold of John Hugh. Now I'm dealing with the Solomon's. It's very hard. You ask a question, you don't get an answer for two weeks. Um, but you just need one person that's consistent. No, plus, People tend to retire pretty early in the Pacific. You know, they sort of go off for various health reasons. You know, either they're one year, they're not year, they're the next year. Um, you need someone that can take responsibility and that can train down the track. Now, sorry, the second question was part, second part of the question. From a systems point of view, so what are the key things that the healthcare facilities need to have in line to ensure that the incinerator can operate well? Well, really, uh, no, they've got to have a budget. Now, quite often, you know, we've put these plants in and they can't run them. They can't afford the diesel to run the plants. No, so the units sit in there and are, uh, no, unused. And again, but the main thing is ownership. Someone needs to take ownership, take responsibility for this unit and, no, um, look after the unit. Yeah, thank, thank you, Michael. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a big point. I mean, we've been... As you, I think, know, Rosie, we've been entering into, um, you know, memorandum of understandings with our hospitals uh, and with ministries of health to 
to make certain that, you know, we're all kind of agreed on continued maintenance of these facilities. So that is, I know that 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 can be a problem. I, I did note there's there's a question from our friends here in Samoa. Um, and I think this might be to you folks at the World Bank. Is any funding available to dispose or export cytotoxic and genotoxic wastes and other toxic chemical waste generated in the hospitals? Um, I'm just going to open that up to anybody who might have a, an answer well, can, to that. I can make a comment in regards to cytotoxics. I've been asked a number of times by you know, the Solomons, Tonga, you know, can they burn cytotoxics in my incinerators? And yes, those units are designed to run at 1,000 degrees, which is the minimum temperature you need for cytotoxic. I wouldn't try burning them in a smaller, cheaper incinerator. But on my units, yes, you can certainly burn cytotoxics. And I'd pretty much say you can burn pretty much anything, provided it's in limited quantities. If um, It's very similar to a has waste incinerator, provided you're not burning more than, say, 10% of the total load, you can pretty much put most things in there. And for cytotoxics, which need to burn at 1,000 degrees, I also recommend that if they are going to have, they have a large quantity of cytotoxics, burn it on the second burn cycle for the day. So the incinerator is operational, it's at very high temperatures. Do your first load on general waste, then do a second load of your cytotoxics. Can I, can I also jump in on the question because it's coming from Samoa? Uh, I don't have the explicit answer right now, but given that we have a comprehensive healthcare waste management program in Samoa. Could I actually ask you if you could drop me a, a, a line or email and let's get in touch with the, uh, we have a very good uh, healthcare waste management specialist in, in Samoa that we are working at the Ministry of Health. And let's try to get in touch and see to, to see if we can find a, a joint solution. Would it be possible to share the email with the participants? Sorry, sure, Sorry, Natasha, that's directed to myself. Yeah, no problem at all. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Actually, I do. I do have one question myself. I, um, and, and I, I guess I'm curious. I, I'd like to hear what you know, Michael. I'd just like to hear what your opinion is. But I, this is really to you, Rosie, and to, to Nasha, uh, Natasha. Um, kind of what perhaps the World Bank is thinking. Um, you know, what do you think should be our long-term goals in terms of these addressing healthcare waste like this? Clearly the incinerators, um, and we're looking at a short-term, um, you know, five-year type of uh, sustainability or 10-year sustainability effort with these incinerators. But I think as Michael is saying that, you know, they are, they do have a shelf life. Um, uh, and so we have to start thinking maybe more longer term. And I'm curious to know what the World Bank is thinking. Not that you necessarily could speak for the whole bank, but but I am curious, particularly since you've been doing a, a bunch of work in PNG and Tonga and some other areas. So I certainly can't talk for the whole bank, um, but I think we've talked about it before, Lance. We're, we're very interested to see the work that you and WHO are doing on alternative technologies. Um, I know there's a lot of other options out there and it'll be interesting to see the practicalities of them, the sustainability of them. But on the flip side, what I really want to focus on for Pacific is building up those systems and the capacity. So whichever technical solution we end up promoting and financing, um, I think all of them are going to have issues if we don't um, implement good management systems around them. Te technically, the incinerator is probably the most least technical and the easiest item to understand and to keep operational. Um, a lot of those alternatives utilize shredders, chemical disinfection, microwaves, um, vastly more complex than an incinerator. And I think will be you know, very hard to maintain and keep going in the Pacific environment. We should get an example of that in Tonga you know, in the next year or two. Um, they're currently putting in a microwave unit. So we'll see how that, that pans out. Okay. Um, here is uh, another question. Um, in the chat room, what is the possibility of normal, normal, normal burning of medical waste and capturing the smokes, the smoke and fumes to be purified before entering the atmosphere? We do a lot of burning and need the air to be purified. So maybe this is the discussion of the bag house or the, 
the the uh, the emissions treatment, uh, well, Michael. In terms of an incinerator, if it's designed properly and working properly, there should be no visible smoke. All you should see is a heat haze. Now, on a cheaper incinerator where they make compromises and promise the world and deliver very little, um, no, it's going to smoke most of the time. But on a properly designed incinerator, running at a thousand degrees, one second retention time, proper control of of air, combustion air, uh, should only be something. No, only smokes when something has gone wrong. Okay. Now, um, you could go the next. The next step beyond that is air pollution control equipment. Now you could, as I said, you can go to EC standards if you've got the budget, but you certainly wouldn't be able to operate that in the Pacific. Okay, well, well, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Rosie, and thank you, Natasha. I'm, I'm, I'm getting the hook. Um, it says that perhaps this can be our last question. I think uh, uh, we're out of time, um, but thank you all very much for participating. I greatly appreciated uh, you know, I learned a lot uh, myself in your presentation, Michael, and thank you. Uh, and same, same with that, with Rosie and Natasha. Thank you very much for your time and energy, and thank you for the participants for asking the questions. And um, 